with us. And some of us, uh, we ought to be thanking God that he's such a kind God and brings us to a point where it's the end of us and he's willing to come into that, that heart that says, all right, you, you, you're done taking control of this? You done, you done being the master of your fate and captain of your soul? All right, let me, let me step in. And so that song, Your Mercy, man, that resonates with me because God is so good. God is so good. So good to be with you guys today. And uh, excited to dive into 1 John chapter 5. Turn your Bibles, if you would, real quick. Um, if I don't get a chance to tell you, uh, happy Thanksgiving. Hopefully I'll see some of you guys out in the, uh, the football field on Thursday, the gridiron, you know, where we get to live vicariously through all those better athletes than we are. And um, ch- I'm going to channel my personal Uncle Rico. You guys remember Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite? So, Napoleon, see those mountains over there, right? You know probably pull a hammy or throw out my shoulder or something, but we're going to have fun together. So uh, invite someone to join you. It should be a lot of fun. Also, the Get Connected time today uh, after second service, lunch and conversation. One of those kind of speak now, forever hold your peace kind of meetings, you know what I'm saying? Like come with any, and when Ryan says any or all questions, literally it's that. And uh, really have a good, good conversation. So those of you who are fairly new to the church and want to know more, uh, you're invited out to that. Did someone ask where Lori was this morning? Yeah, when I left the house, she was in like REM stage 10. So, I mean, she was so deep in sleep, and uh, she needs it. So, uh, I love her. So, I think she's coming to second service today. So, good to have you guys here. Um, uh, Sorry, you know, I heard something this week from somebody. Someone said, you know what? I I like you as a pastor. You're a little too manic for me, though. Uh, I I take that as a compliment, right? So, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just super jazzed to be with you guys and excited to be here and unpack God's word. And so turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to look at the final several verses there, 13 through 21. And, um, and also, thank you for your generosity to, uh, to us so that we can be generous to others. I literally went down to a ministry in Mesa, uh, got a phone call. They said, we need 150 turkeys. For vets who who just are going to have a Thanksgiving, but they don't have money for for a turkey dinner, and I said 150 turkeys. What does that cost? About thousand bucks. I went down there with a check and said, "Go bless those vets." And so, thank you, you guys. So, I mean, gosh, gosh darn it, these guys served our country, right? At least we can give them a turkey dinner, right? So, you guys helped us do that. So, I love being the messenger of that kind of stuff, like walking down, like you know, a little little pep in my step, and be like, "Here you go." Right. So and there's many more opportunities that are going to come up to bless others. So thank you for your generosity. And you guys are phenomenal in, as far as your giving. So and speaking of Thanksgiving, if you don't have a family you get to spend Thanksgiving with this this weekend, let me know. We've got some homes that have just said, hey, we've got an extra couple seats at the table. And we know holidays can be a very lonely time for some people. And we want to extend an invitation to you to say, hey, if you need family, we've got families here that would love to uh, enfold you and love you and feed you. Uh, So if you're in that category, please let me know. Love to put you in in an empty chair at someone's table this Thanksgiving. Amen? Cool. Turn your Bibles to 1 John 5. We're going to finish 1 John 5 today. And then I was thinking to myself, you know, what are we going to do next week? And then I thought to myself, well, there's 2nd and 3rd John. And so next week, we're going to tackle what I call the postcards of the, of the New Testament. These are the little tiny books that rarely do we dive into. I mean, when was the last time you heard a message in 2 John or 3 John? Uh, it's like me introducing you to my oldest child and not introducing you to the other two, you know? It's just unfair because they're included in the Bible for a reason. So next Sunday, we're going to tackle 2 John and 3 John as kind of a wrap-up to this. And then I'll announce to you guys what, what's coming up in December and in the coming year. Lots of cool stuff. So... So 1994, uh, Northwest Airlines, you guys remember Northwest Airlines? So they did this interesting deal where they said, we're going to offer a mystery fare. So for $59, you come to the airline counter, pay 59 bucks, and we're going to give you a round trip ticket to someplace that you don't know. So for instance, Indianapolis airline counter, 1,500 people showed up. First come, first serve, 59 bucks, send me somewhere. And there are people going, okay, oh, I hope I go to New Orleans. And they ended up going to to Minneapolis. Now, this is wintertime. And then that person was so disheartened that they got a ticket to Minneapolis. They're going through the airline terminal saying, anyone want to go to Mall of America? Anyone want this ticket? Like, they were so disappointed. But yet, 
you're putting money forward for something that you don't know that it's certain. I mean, yeah, you could hope you're going to go to New Orleans, but you end up in Minneapolis. Well, that was your decision. And how many people buy in to mystery fairs when it comes to life, right? Like, I'm going to put all my chips on this. I'm going to put all my investment over here. And I hope and I hope and I hope it turns out. And I want you to know, as brothers, sisters, fellow humans in this journey we call life, there are certainties. You don't have to wake up and and go, okay, today's another mystery fair day. Where am I going? What's going on? Who am I? What's, what's the life all about? What's my purpose? You can have assurances and confidence and certainties. And that's John's desire in his letter to us. That you don't have to wake up and go, does God love me today or does he not love me today? You know, if, if I die today, am I going to heaven or am I not going to heaven? And yet our souls are ransacked by such uncertainties. And I'm going to tell you, it need not be this way. See, you need to know that our faith is not an I hope so faith. Our faith is not I think so faith. Our faith is an I know so faith. Write those three words down. I know so. And I want you to know this for certain today, John wants you to be confident in your faith. Because what does confidence bring? It brings security. It brings assurance. It brings courage. It brings peace. It brings hope. When I exalt the name of Christ and I present Christ before us, we should be looking at Christ and going, yes, there's guarantees when it comes to life. That as sure as Jesus was who he said he was, that he did what he said he was going to do, and he rose again on the third day after being crucified on that cruel cross, we know that God has power over sin, death, the grave. And if he's got power over that, he's got power over our lives. And we can have those assurances today. Amen? So we close out 1 John this morning with some I know so beliefs. Some I know so truths. And so we're going to look at four blessings you are given as a follower of Christ. Now, the foundation of everything we've been talking about up to this point really relies on three words. Write these words down. Number one, belief. Number two, obedience. And number three, love. John's been talking about these three themes throughout his letter. Belief, obedience, love. And if all three of these things are present in your life, these blessings are assurances to you. Number one, belief. You must believe in Jesus. There is no blessing if you don't have Jesus. So John is very clear. He sets out in his first chapter, we are eyewitnesses of Jesus' majesty. He was God who come in the flesh. All who believe in him have eternal life. Belief in Christ is essential. Number two, That belief in Christ ought to translate into obedience in your life. Belief that doesn't impact behavior is a false belief. You guys tracking with that? So belief must translate into behavior. Henceforth, I am going to show obedience to my Lord, to my Savior. My walk will match my talk. And the person who says a big game and they believe in Jesus and yet they don't look like Jesus in their life, I'm going to tell you that's a false belief. That doesn't mean we're perfect in our obedience. Amen? So let's extend each other some grace and realize that we all mess up. We all fail. We all fall. This is part of life. But what you do after you fail, after you mess up, is going to tell me a lot about your walk with Jesus. The fact that he would restore Peter after Peter's denial, right? And he says, Peter, you love me, right? And three times. And he says, then, right, you're you're, you're set forth to do my work. Like Christ forgives Peter for the denial. And what good word is there for us in that? That God is ready to pick us up and say, right, get back on the path. Number three, love. You say you believe, you say you believe, and, and that translates to obedience. Well, what does that look like in loving people, all people? What does it mean loving people in the church? What does it mean loving people outside the church? Is your attitude towards others characterized by love, or is it characterized by hate? Do you love all people as you've been loved by God, which means unconditionally? 
So these three things are critical to John's thinking. Now, if these three things are present, you can be assured you are saved. You have eternal life. And what are the blessings that come with that? Four of them. Number one is this. The blessing of position. Notice verse 13, which we covered last week briefly. But we'll start again this week with this verse. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Lord, uh, of the Son of God, in order that you may know you have eternal life. And this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask God... And God will, for him, give him life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. We know that no one who is born of God sins, but he who was born of God keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding in order that we may know him who is true. We are in him who is true and in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. So, interesting summary as John ends this part of his letter to the early church 2,000 years ago. But there's four points I want to point out the first being this your position look at verse 13 you can know you can have confidence that you have eternal life that if you believe in the son of god so without beating the horse again i'm going to show you that you can know to be you can know you are saved by your belief by your obedience by your love you have this certainty that you are saved no longer does your heart have to do somersaults as far as, uh, you know, this fickleness that takes over, like, uh, I'm doubt, I'm discouraged, does God really love me? You can know for sure you're saved if you believe in the Son of God. Your position is secure. You've been bought with a price. God has put incredible value upon your life. Do you deserve it? No. But did he do it? Yes. Reminds me this week, I read about the Da Vinci painting that was sold for $450 million. The Savior of the World picture 450 million bucks and we sit there and go i can't even fathom that amount of money and especially that amount of money being put forth for a painting right i mean and i don't think it's a big painting at that if i'm spending 450 million dollars on a painting, i want a gigantic painting but because it's associated with da vinci so you know there's this incredible price tag put on but i'm going to remind you of something write this verse down you've been bought with a price because You are God's painting. You are God's masterpiece. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, says this. You are God's workmanship. You are God's, literally, masterpiece. And God said, you are such an amazing masterpiece because you're created in my image You are worthy of dignity and respect, but now you have the sin issue, the sin problem. I'm going to step in. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to pay for your life. And what does God pay for you, his masterpiece? The price of his only begotten son. Take that, Da Vinci. Take that anonymous buyer of this painting for 450 million bucks, right? We sit there and go, 450 million dollars. I sit there and go, that's chump change compared to the fact that you have been redeemed by the precious blood of God himself. You tell me if that's not worth rejoicing. You tell me that that's not newsworthy. You tell me that that's not worth celebrating. The fact that God spared no expense because you are his masterpiece. You are given a position now in the family of God. You are now a son or daughter of the king. And you tell me that doesn't put a little pep in your step. You are given a position that you could never lose because it was never yours to earn to begin with. It's all in God's hands. And who will ever be able to separate separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ? Romans chapter 8. 
So John reminds us, your position is secure. Do you believe in the Son of God? Then let that belief translate to obedience. Let that obedience translate into love. And just know at the end of the day, you can have confidence that you are God's kid. Amen? Point number two, the blessing of petition. Don't think for a moment we're going to fly through this message. So you're like, oh, he's right through point number one. Point number two is going to take a while because this is the blessing of petition. Maybe in on the side, right prayer. Because notice how John shifts gears and for several verses starts talking about prayer. And we need to talk about two forms of prayer. One is confident prayer. And number two is intercessory prayer. Don't ask me how to spell it. It's too early, even though I've had four shots of espresso and I'm manic right now. There's confident prayer and there's intercessory prayer. Confident prayer, verse 14, look what John says. He says, and if we have the Son, we have confidence, which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Verse 15, and we know that he hears us in whatever we ask. We know that we have the request with which we've asked from him. So stop right there. The reason, point number one, your position's important, is because it gives you encouragement when it comes to praying and the confidence that God says you can now have access to the throne of grace, according to Hebrews chapter 4. You now have access to God. And you have access because of Jesus. And if Jesus has given you access, meaning God has accepted you, the mere fact that God's accepted you ought to say, I can approach my Abba Father. I can approach my, my Heavenly Father and say, Daddy, I need this. Daddy, I need help in understanding this. Daddy, I'm helping struggling with this. And Hebrews 4 is such a beautiful passage because it says you can approach the throne of grace with confidence, with boldness. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. So when it comes to confident prayer, perhaps we need to, we need to bulk up on the confidence and just, just ask God. Because there's two certainties that, Paul, that uh, John talks about here. There's the certainty of hearing, and there's the certainty of having. Now write those down. These are bonus points. I should have put them in your outline. I didn't. Forgive me. But there's the certainty of hearing and the certainty of having. God hears us. Notice what he says there. God hears us. Just because he hears us doesn't necessarily mean we're going to have what we bring to him with confidence. We may not get what we have or what we want because we're, we're approaching his throne with, with this boldness. See, notice what is critical here in understanding. Whatever you ask, verse 14, according to his will. Let me just, let me just burst the bubble right now. When it comes to your life with God, this has nothing to do with you and everything to do with him. Life is not about your will. Life is about his will. Even Jesus in the garden prayed, not my will be done, but yours. We can probably all nod, give an amen, but we all wrestle with wanting our will done. We all wrestle with discerning the will of God and we are blinded to his will at times because we want our will so much. And God is not going to give you your will if it's out of line with his. He's not a God who's going to go, well, what's your purpose in life? What's your kingdom all about? Let me bend over and uh, fulfill your every dream and, and imagination. No, God is a God who says, this world is my world. This plan is my plan, and you need to get on board with what I want because this has nothing to do with you. This has everything to do with me. George Mueller, who, when it comes to prayer, he was a guy who ran an orphanage in England 100-plus years ago. This guy never asked for a dime, but every day committed to pray for the orphans that he was over seen and in charge of and there were days when there was not a stitch of food in the pantry and he'd tell his his volunteers set the tables hundreds of place settings set the tables 
and he'd go and pray. And all of a sudden, there'd be a knock on the door, and this guy says, yeah, um, my bread cart just fell over, and I can't use the bread. Uh, can you guys use it? What? And then moments later, seriously, story. Oh, my milk cart broke. You, can you guys use some milk at the orphanage? And Mueller just depended upon the, the work of God. And here's what he said. I love this quote. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. Mueller said it is laying hold of God's willingness. We think God is just this, just this deadbeat cosmic daddy who just doesn't want what's best for us. And what you don't realize is that God knows what's best and he wants to give you what's best, but the problem is we just don't know what's best. See, it's not, laying, it's not overcoming God's reluctance, it's laying hold of his willingness. See, there's the certainty of hearing and then there's the certainty of having. God is not going to give you everything you want. God's will is linked to his word. Now, let me just, what hinders prayer? What is it that hinders prayer? Four things, write these down. Number one, disbelief. John chapter 14. If you don't believe in Jesus, God is not going to hear your prayers. It is through Jesus, our high priest, that we have access. No Jesus, no access. No Jesus, no hearing. Number two, disobedience. The fact that if there's sin that resides in me, God will not hear me. Psalm 66. If I cherish sin in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Psalm 66, verse 18. And not only that, but 1 Peter 3, there's a warning against husbands who are not treating their wives in a Christ-honoring way. And it says, if you don't love your wife the way Christ loves the church, your prayers will be hindered. Men, husbands, soon-to-be husbands, take note. You have a responsibility to lead your home like Jesus would lead your home. All of us can do it. If we do it imperfectly, that's okay. But if you do not have that sensitivity of Christ in your home, God says your prayers will be hindered. Wow. First Peter chapter three, verse seven. Number three reason our prayers are hindered. Wrong motives. James chapter four, verse three. The reason you don't have is because you ask with wrong motives, James says. See, we want what we want, not what God wants. So the question is, what does God want? And God will give you exactly what you need. It may not be what you want, it may not be what you like, but it's exactly what you need. Number four, or prayers contrary to God's will. Prayer must be according to God's will, as John says, in the direction God is going with a view to obtaining the purposes he intends. So what does this look like practically? See, prayer, oftentimes we think of the communicating piece. I'm going to tell you the communicating part of prayer is, is the result of the more important piece we tend to miss out on, and that is the communing piece. Your communion with God will lead to communicating with God. Too many of us just want the request, and we don't want the relationship, and you must have the relationship in order to have the request. If you abide with me and I abide with you, ask whatever you want and it will be given to you. John chapter 15, Jesus says. Right? What's the relationship? What's the, the premise? The premise is you abide with him. You commune with him. You have a relationship with him. And what's the promise? Ask whatever you want. Ask whatever you want. But there's got to be relationship. This is what God says to us. In order to have relationship with God, you've got to spend time with God. You've got to listen to God. You've got to pay attention to God. And what you begin to see when you commune with God is you begin to see things from God's point of view. You begin to understand God's heart because this is not about us changing God's mind. This is about Him changing our minds. We become so acquainted with God's heart through His Word that we develop a better prayer life because of our communion with him. What does this mean practically? Let me give you a, a great little tool. You guys ready for this? So pick a number. Somebody pick a number between 1 and 150. 61. Okay, turn to Psalm 61 right now. 
Sometimes you guys don't know how to pray. People come and like, I don't know where to start. I don't know what to do. I'm going to give you one of the easiest lessons on prayer right now that's going to fulfill this teaching point that I'm trying to instruct you with, God's will, God's word, how they're so linked that will lead to a vibrant prayer life. Turn to Psalm 61. Is this a good one? Are you laughing already? All right, here we go. God's, if you have not yet learned to use God's word as fuel for your prayer life, today's your lucky day. Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God. Give heed to my prayer. Wow, that, that seems pretty appropriate, doesn't it? I'm glad it wasn't like Proverbs, let her breasts always satisfy you. That would have been really awkward, right? Like, thank you, Jesus, right? Okay, so just stop. So Psalm 61, right? You got 150 Psalms. We picked Psalm 61. Hear my cry, O God. Give heed to my prayer. Stop right there. Can you not turn that into a prayer? And go, God, I am crying right now. Please hear me. From the end of the earth, I call to you when my heart is faint. You ever come before God, you just feel like, I don't know what to say. I don't know where to start. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. My vantage point is pretty dismal right now. Take me to a higher place where I can get better perspective. For you have been a refuge for me. Your track record, God, has proven 100% every time. You're a God who doesn't fail. You're a God who doesn't let, down, let me down. A tower of strength against my enemy. You got some enemies in your life right now? Your, your boss, some coworkers, family member? You're dreading Thanksgiving because you're seeing the enemy as your brother, your sister, mom, dad, I don't know. Be that, be that source of strength for me right now, Lord. You know how I'm wrestling. You know how I'm struggling. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Well, that's a guarantee. And let me just tell you, God's tent is the best tent. I mean, it's like better than Barnum and Bailey's brothers, Ringling. Yeah, you guys know. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. How big are God's wings? How strong are God's wings? I mean, right there. I mean, I'm already tearing up. Because it's like, this is, this is what we want. And we just arbitrarily picked a number. And you don't think God wants us to hear this right here and, and make these words our prayer? You don't know what to pray. God's going to give you the food which you need to use for prayer. Turn to any psalm. Give me another number. Nancy, one, between 1 and 150. 57, you don't have to turn far, far. Nancy was gracious to you. Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you. In the shadow of your wings I will take refuge. What what's, uh, what's up, you guys talking with each other? You see how the psalmist in his heart is, is exactly where a lot of our hearts are at right now? I mean, this, this is God giving us a, 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 a insight into this man's diary. And even though many of these psalms are attributed to, attributed to King David, don't put David on a pedestal. He was a person just like you and I. Struggled, was tempted, was enticed, made bad decisions, had a horrible family life, screwed up his marriage. I mean, think about it. We're in good company. And yet God says, use this as your prayer book. You don't know what to pray, just pray through the Psalms. Pray through the words of Jesus. Verse 2, I will cry to God most high for God who accomplishes all things for me. God, if this is true, please help me understand what this looks like in my life. Because it doesn't look like right now you're accomplishing anything for me. Help me see what you see. Help me understand your heart. He will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me. God will vindicate. Amen. God will take care of your enemies. You don't have to do it. Don't fight fire with fire, but you love and you pray and let God vindicate in the end. Any one of you could do this. This is, this is, this is confident praying. 
the Psalms. Should we do another one? No, we're not going to do another one. Open the word. His word is connected to his will. And then what you do in prayer is you connect his word and his will with your heart. And then God says, ask whatever you want. He's not going to supply all your greeds. He's going to supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Let me say it again. God is not going to supply all your greeds, but he will supply all your needs in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Is that good? We need that. See, this connects not only your, your desire to understand God's word, but your desire to, God's desire for you to come to him and talk to him. Commune with him and communicate with him and you will be enriched. John 15, if we abide with Jesus and God's word abides in us, we may ask whatever we will and it will be given. If God abides with us and his word abides in us, Jesus makes the connection. Communion, communicating. You can't have one without the other. And let me add another verse. Psalm 84, no good thing will God withhold from him who walks according to his ways. Psalm 84, verse 11. Second point, intercessory prayer. Now, this is where things get interesting. I'm going to tell you right now. I spent hours looking over these couple verses, and I'm going to tell you Bible scholars and theologians and pastors and preachers are not on the same page as to what uh, John is talking about here in verse 16 and 17. Let's read it again. Because these are very confusing, perhaps some of the most confusing verses in all the Bible. And it, uh, I think I've arrived at a conclusion. I'm going to offer it to you in the context of John's letter that I think makes the most sense. Verse 16, if anyone sees a brother committing sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sin, not leading to death. There is a sin leading to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not leading to death. Okay, so clearly there's two things before us. There's a sin not leading to death, and then there's a sin leading to death. How do we make sense of these things? Now, he says in verse 17, all wrongdoing is sin. And I'm going to tell you right now, sin is sin. And while all sin is abhorrent before the eyes of God, not all the consequences of sin are equal right stealing a pack of gum is a sin but the consequences of that act is nothing compared to a a serial killer but sin is sin in the eyes of god and if you if you mess up in one area of the law you've ruined the whole law so what is the sin not leading to death and what is the sin that's leading to death i believe what he has in context here is number one There's a fellow spiritual sibling, a brother or sister in Christ that is living with some unrighteousness. And John says, pray for them so that they may be restored. But there's people perhaps in your midst who don't know Christ. They're not a spiritual sibling in Christ. Don't pray for them because they don't need to be restored. They need to repent and to know Jesus first. Okay? So the sin not leading to death is the fact that you and I fall into all sorts of snares and entanglements. And perhaps one of the greatest gifts we can give one another is to pray for one another, especially if we hear or see something bad has happened. You've made a poor decision. You've made a wrong choice. We do these things. And we need to be brothers and sisters in Christ and pray for one another. Praying for another person is not gossiping about them. All right? We don't go to somebody else and say, did you hear so-and-so? Right? That's like the old school Baptist prayer chain, right? All it is is gossip. But if there's a heart that resembles Galatians chapter 6, where it says, boy, you are called to carry one another's burdens. You're come alongside one another and encourage one another and lift one another up. These are not sins leading to death because in Christ we have life. And nothing we could ever do could ever take us, take that life from us. But the problem is when we mess up, who is in our life to restore us? Who is in our life to point us in the right right direction? And that's why he says, if anyone sees a brother committing a sin, 
And so what do we do? We pray. May the first thing you do is pray for that person. Pray that God would change their heart because here's the promise of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 12, if they're truly in Christ, God disciplines His kids, and especially when they make poor choices. He's a loving Father who steps in, and that person receives the disciplining hand of the Lord in their life, and they are restored. It's not punish, it's discipline. And there's a difference between those two things. And then John says, but there are some in your midst. And he's writing in a context where there are people that came in his church that were spewing bad theology, trying to lead people astray. And he's saying, don't pray for them. But pray, perhaps, if, that they would repent. I mean, think about the early disciples. Would you not pray for Peter and pray for Judas? Or vice versa? I mean, one of them clearly knew Christ, one didn't. The bottom line is this, and I'm not going to die on this hill as far as my interpretation, but I will tell you that I think the bottom line is you pray for other people. And perhaps with those that are not saved, perhaps are praying for them, that doesn't mean their repentance, are fruitless prayers. You ever thought about this? Now, I'm going to probably get a little, little pushback from, from, from me on this. Perhaps we don't send out the message, well, let me pray for you. Oh, you know, my non-believing neighbors, their marriage is falling apart. Well, I'm just going to pray for them. Don't pray for their marriage to be healed. Pray for their hearts to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. That doesn't mean you come across unloving or uncaring. But their need is not for their marriage to be healed. Their need is for them to know the Lordship of Christ. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? So maybe we need to realize that there are people that, yeah, we pray for their restoration, but there's a lot of people that we need to pray for their repentance. And it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. Amen? All right. Well, I hope that was a good explanation. Let's move on. All right. Number three, the blessing of protection. So we have the blessing of position. You're in Christ. You're his kid. Awesome. We have the blessing of petition that now I'm accepted. I have access to the throne of of God and and I can be bold and confident in my praying and I can also intercede on behalf of you as you would intercede for me. Number three, there's the blessing of protection. Can I just say it this way? Jesus has your back. Isn't that awesome? When you know somebody's got your back, there could be awful things that come into your life and, and knowing that you have a friend who's got your back brings this buoyancy to say, I'm not going to drown in this. I'm not going to be destroyed by this. I've had people betray me. I've had people uh, turn to a Benedict Arnold on me. Uh, you know what? And it's those friends that have stood with me. They may not agree with me. They may point out certain things in my character. Fine, but you know what? You know at the end of the day, they're not there to just tear you down. They're there to criticize in order to build you up. And what better advocate do we have than Jesus? Look at verse 18. John says this. We know that no one who is born of God sins. Now what he says there is not that when you come to know Jesus, life is perfect and you don't ever make mistakes again. You don't make a habitual practice of sin anymore. You grow in godliness. You learn to do away with childish things and poor choices. And you begin to grow in godliness. You sin less. Amen? So the, the fact of what John's saying here is not that you don't sin, it's that the frequency of your sin becomes less and less and less. Why? Because of God's work in you by His Spirit to make you more like Jesus. But here's the main part. Look, if He who was born of God uh, keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. Meaning that, boy, Satan, the enemy, would love to just ransack your, your soul. And God says, I'm not going to let him do that. Luke 22, it's interesting, Jesus says to Peter, Satan has asked me permission to sift you like wheat. Luke 22. Now imagine, here's Peter listening to the teachings of Jesus. and Jesus says, just so you know, Satan and I had a conversation the other day, and he wants to basically destroy your life. (laughs) Oh, really? Okay. I'd be like, what? Satan has asked me permission. Notice first. Satan can't do anything to you unless he goes to God for permission first. That's huge. Job 1, Satan approached God. Hey, can, can I have access to Job's life? 
See, Satan is God's Satan. He's God's devil. And he's on a leash, and the length of that leash is determined by God alone. He lets the leash out as much as he wants. He pulls it back in when he wants. Satan is God's Satan. But he has to ask God permission. Now, the good news is this. God is not out to destroy you. So what he allows Satan to do when he wants to ask to to sift your life like wheat, right? Imagine that, right? Can I take Carol's life and sift her like wheat? And Satan says, I want to I want to sift. And Jesus says, I'll give you permission, but I'm going to draw the parameters around this. Why? Because he's going to protect you, not destroy you. Luke chapter 22, read it. Satan prowls about like an enemy, seeking those whom he may devour. But you need to know that the power of God is greater than the prowess of the enemy. You need to understand that there's spiritual war out there. This world lives under the world system. It is influenced by the evil one. But you are delivered from the kingdom of darkness, and you are in now God's glorious kingdom of light through Christ. And he will never allow evil to befall you. Everything God permits has been passed through his sovereign will and determined this is good for you. He is a good protector. He has your back he is your good shepherd he is your great warrior he is your full armor of god and nothing can separate you from his protective love know that but don't underestimate the power of the enemy he blinds the 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 hearts of unbelievers he snatches the word of god from human hearts he deceives by miraculous signs and wonders he entices through fleshly desires and pride but greater is he who's in you than he who's in the world Amen? He is a God who protects you. And so, verse 19, we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. For some strange reason, God has given uh, Satan permission to influence this world, and the world is corrupt. If you have not reached that conclusion yet, you are living in a cave. The world is corrupt, The world lives in this illusion, and God wants you to live in the realm of reality. Praise God, we have Jesus who protects us. But number four, here's the last point, we also now in Christ have the blessing of perception. And I love how John closes this, and this is good application for us. Because he says, and we know that the Son of God has come, and he has given us understanding. Can I just tell you right now? Christians are the smartest people in the room. Or ought to be. I'm I'm reaching on this. Because there's some Christians I sit there and go, really? Please don't open your mouth again. Please don't give us your thoughts on this, right? We, according to Colossians, verse chapter 3, have been given the mind of Christ. Got the mind of Jesus. You who are now in Christ, according to 1 Corinthians chapter chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man, the man of this world, does not understand the things of God, for the things of God are spiritually appraised. Meaning, special understanding into the realm of reality is exclusively given to those that are in Christ. Hence, this word of understanding. You as a believer are now able to see things like no one else sees them. Why? Because you're better than them? No, because you have Jesus. And Jesus is the truth. And Jesus is the life. And Jesus is the way. So you have been given great understanding in order that we might know him who is true. And we are in him who is true. His son Jesus. This is the true God and eternal life. So notice how John comes full circle. Remember how we talked about exalting Christ? We're going to close by talking about exalting Christ because in Him is truth. In Him is life. In Him is reality. And isn't that the amazing thing about the ministry of Jesus? He came to this world so that we are no longer bound in darkness, groping about trying to make sense of things, but He brings light so that we can understand. He cares about my life. He cares about my marriage. He cares about my children. He cares about my finances. He cares about my vocation. He cares about how I care for you. He cares about all things in my life. But without Jesus, I have no understanding of these things. 
So now we have a responsibility as believers to help the world understand what it doesn't understand. Because what happens if you don't have Jesus? Verse 21, little children, guard yourselves from idols. In context, he's saying, what do we do? Well, we manufacture gods after our own image. And we think these idols are going to bring satisfaction. We think these idols are going to bring us fulfill, you know, fulfilling our desires and they're just going to leave us empty. Matter of fact, I was listening to the, I, I love talk radio. Sometimes it drives me bonkers. It's probably why I'm so manic on Sundays, okay? I'm listening to talk radio and so the, the shooting in Northern California. So it's like every Sunday, I'm like, okay, so the shooting this past week and then the, so the shooting in Northern California, right? And these guys are talking, they're going back and forth, and someone asks a really interesting question. Why are people so angry? Right? There's this shooting. What, why was that guy so angry? And there's this shooting. And there's this. Uh, why are people so angry? And I stopped. I didn't stop my car. That would have been stupid, right? So I, I stopped, turned off the radio, and I just stopped for a moment. And I said, you know why people are angry? It's because their idols are failing them. Okay? The reason people are angry, and it doesn't even have to be anyone, it could be someone having a fight with their wife. It could be have someone having just being disappointed with their children. It can be people that are just, just not having a productive time at work or what. Our idols are failing us. Because idols cannot do for you with what God has designed your life to to absorb and to embrace and to follow and to worship, idols cannot deliver on what they promise. Why do you think all these sexual assault issues are rising to the surface? And I'm praying for people. I'm praying for people that find forgiveness and healing and and you just wonder who's next. Well, again, here is the realm in which the world thought, yeah, these things are going to bring satisfaction. And they're failing them. See, guard yourselves from idols of power, control, comfort, approval, position, applause, pleasure, because these idols are not true. They can't offer life and they'll never deliver on what they promise. Only Christ satisfies. So John closes and says, you have Jesus Lean on him for understanding. You have his mind. The spiritual things given to you are not understood by those who don't believe, but they're given to you so that you may understand in the end, your only treasure is Christ. And you must have him to make sense of this world. Because if anything comes into your life promising truth apart from Christ, it's an idol. If anything comes into your life promising you life that's apart from Christ, it is an idol. Let me just be very clear. An idol is anything you love, enjoy, pursue more than God, more than Christ. And even Friedrich Nietzsche, the one who said God is dead and we've killed him, said this. There are more idols in the world than there are realities. John Calvin said our hearts are little idol factories and we will produce idols that make us feel good. No, they're idols that will let you down in the end and leave you bankrupt. And there's one God, Jesus, who promises satisfaction. He is your treasure. That's it. And that's why John chapter 4, Jesus says this, whoever drinks from the water that I'm going to give him will never thirst again, ever. And not only am I going to give him a sip, I'm going to put a well in his soul and it's unending when I'm able to supply him. Are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm not going to, I mean, I'll come alongside you if you make poor choices, but I'm going to point you to the treasure of Jesus in the end. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, you know what, yeah, that was a bad decision you made, but your satisfaction needs to be Jesus and Jesus alone. Ladies and gentlemen, when will we come to the point when we realize that Jesus is all we have? And why? Because it's Jesus is all we need. Amen? So the moment you start hearing this stuff, 
coming out of the news, out of the headlines, through your Twitter feed, all that stuff, you just realize these are indications that the idols of this world are failing people. And the one that will never fail you is Christ Jesus. Lean on Him. Listen to Him. Embrace His Word. And drink deeply from the well that He has put in your soul. Jeremiah chapter 2. Look at it later. He says, the reason the people are so destitute and desperate and disillusioned and discouraged is because they're trying to build cisterns for water that can hold no water. Quit building your own cisterns and drink deeply from the fountain that is known as Christ and find satisfaction for all eternity. Amen? Boom, we're done. First John, you guys did it. Good closing words of encouragement? You better believe it. Good, good truth for us to embrace? Good message for us to take to a world that's desperate for this? You better believe it. So thank you. Next week we'll look at 2nd and 3rd John. One message, two, two little postcards in the New Testament. It's going to be fun. And then we'll talk about what we're going to do next. But I'm praying for you guys. Thank you for your prayers for me. I love you. And if there's anything we can do, come alongside of you as a church, as a family, as a community, let us know. And when Ryan says we, we love praying for you, when you fill out those cards, we do. And uh, we're, we're, we're in this journey together. Amen? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, your word is rich. The message from your scriptures is it's, it's true. There's something that when we, when we read it and we, we dive into it, it just it resonates with our hearts and says, yes, this, this, is, this is reality. Lord, forgive us for living in the realm of the illusion. Bring us into the reality, the reality that is given to us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Let us live in a, in a way where Jesus says, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Well, with your mind, yes, we can do this. Lord, our, our desire ought to be to bring you glory and so move our hearts in that direction. This is about you. This is about your glory. This is about your kingdom. This is about exalting Christ. Nothing else. So, Lord, forgive us for the ways we thought this was about us. Forgive us for the ways we thought this was about building our kingdom and a accomplishing our agenda and in reality this is about you so thank you for john's message may the the truth be sown like seed in our hearts may the enemy not snatch the truth away but may you water it and may the spirit grow it into something fruitful into something beneficial thank you god for today thank you for my family this church i love them so much may we walk in ways worthy of our calling in christ and may we seek to bring you glory in all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're coming back for Get Connected, come back about 1230. We'll get rolling. In the meantime, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift His face towards you and give you grace and peace forever and ever. Happy Thanksgiving. See you guys soon.